we're here today with uh, Theron Anderson discussing a little bit with uh, about uh, some of your uh, winter wheat uh, production practices here in southeast Wyoming. We're in a crop rotation, not on all of it. We're still working into that, trying to eliminate as much summer follow as we can. Primarily a three-year rotation is where I'm at right now. And what crops are you rotating in along with your winter wheat? We use wheat as a base crop, then we go either to corn or uh, sunflowers, and then we go to millet usually, and then back to wheat. I have done a wheat, corn, sunflower, millet rotation. We tried some peas years ago. Uh, that didn't work, so I'm letting the rest of these guys experiment with that one for a while. What are some of the factors that play into your decisions to go with one rotation or another or to try and change it up? Well, some of it's the ground. What I've got up north the highway, dryland corn usually works pretty well up there. I've done sunflowers on some of the rest of this down here. Sometimes that works pretty good. The thing about millet is it's cheap to raise. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have much for specialty equipment. You know, you got to have a pickup header and find somebody with a windrower and lay it down. I bought a, a piece of ground up north of the highway and it had a lot of feral rye in it. And so the, my original intent was to alternate crop to clean it up because we didn't have clear field lead at the time. And uh, so we started with alternate cropping to try and get rid of the rye. Mm -hmm. And the longer I did alternate cropping there, the better I liked it. So that's when we started looking at expanding it and looking at some different crops and different rotations. So what was the benefit to alternate cropping as far as dealing with your rye problem? It got you in a different sequence than a summer follow wheat rotation, which that feral rye all you're doing is pooping it out the back in the combine when you harvest it, and then you got a grain drill and it's out there in the laser, and then the next year you think you've plowed it down and got it going, well you plant it and here it comes again the next year. And that was the main main issue, main reason we got into this. So, yeah. And then where I do raise certified wheat seed, why it's nice to have that two year break mm -hmm. before you come back in with a either a foundation or a registered seed to plant. So. Helps you keep the fields cleaner and... Keeps you clean, breaks some of your weed problems, and then you eliminate uh, volunteer issues. Yeah. How long have you been practicing no-till production? I suppose in some form close to 30 years. I've seen a little increase in organic matter. I think that's probably something that's just flat tough in this country. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things where corn's the best because you get enough residue out there that it hangs around for a while. And I think that uh, that's a big benefit to corn, but you got to be able to afford to raise it too. So, mm -hmm. so are there any other reasons that you went into a no-till system? Well, that was a primary one. The other one was is I didn't like the idea of having half my land out of production all the time. Mm -hmm. That one, and then um, wind erosion back. What was it? The nineties. We had to do all this farm plan stuff to try and eliminate erosion factors and all that thing, and if you got a crop growing out there, why well, you don't have to worry about it blowing away. That part of the system, I think, really has a benefit. What were some of the changes you had to make um, as far as equipment and maybe your farming practices to help accommodate that, that adjustment? Well, the first thing is you better know a, a ag dealer, ag chemical dealer that's can be there timely with a sprayer. So you need, you know, you're going to be putting on uh, a lot of herbicides. You're going to be using a lot more fertilizer. If you're going to row crop stuff, you're going to have row crop equipment. Uh, originally, when I started into, I didn't have any row crop equipment, so we just went, worked with a neighbor, and he had row crop equipment. Changing drills, I had a a hoe drill that was a no-till drill for four or five years. Didn't like it, so then I went to a disc drill. You can control your depth better with the disc drill than you can the hoe drill. Harvesting equipment, you get into more, you know, you got to deal with different things for that. So I got enough headers around here to drive me nuts for crops, <laughs> so. 
Did you see in some of the places where you've been doing a no-till or reduced tillage practice for an extended period of time, did you notice a benefit from that in some of that soil crusting or? Where I've been in it the longest, it's a different soil type and it's a whole lot easier to work with than this stuff down here. Where I had some stand and stubble, the ground didn't wash too bad, and, but where it was black farmed, well, it washed it pretty good. Mm -hmm. But when you get three inch rains in a matter of minutes, why the stand and stubble won't stop it either. So. Yeah. We talked a little bit about some of the reasons that you switched to a no-till system. Are there other benefits that you've seen um, to that as well, other than some of the initial reasons for, for kind of going that route? Erosion is a big one. Hopefully we're gaining on organic matter. Where I've been in it the longest, I've seen it, some increase in organic matter. Then you're getting a crop more than once every two years off that piece of ground. So norm well. You hope to get one off more than once every two years. That doesn't necessarily happen either. But their nat nature has her own quirks. But One of the thoughts is that maybe having a reduced tillage where you're preserving more of that soil moisture, do you think there's some benefits to that in, in helping in some of those more difficult or more drier years? Well, I think any time in this country you can save moisture, it's a benefit. Mm -hmm. You look at what Mother Nature does out here on pasture, the residue's there, you know. Yeah, the cows run through it, but uh, there's a lot left, and that's how that uh, holds that ground. And, and then you get, uh, when it rains, why it infiltrates, falls the roots, and goes down. Mm -hmm. I know I've been to several no-till deals. They talk about hard pans, and, and I think the only way you eliminate that's with organic matter. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that the more residue you can leave out there and still deal with it, the better off you are. So have you seen changes in soil temperatures in going to a no-till system? For the row crop, we strip till. One of the reasons we, well, two reasons we strip till, or I strip till, is one, this ground is usually gets plenty hard. Mm -hmm. You can break it loose and uh, get it opened up. You can put fertilizer down, and then you create kind of a black area so the sun hits it and helps warm that soil up. So you said that you are applying fertilizer. What's your typical fertilizer practice, or does that change too, depending on <laughs> well, that, crops and weather? That depends on the crop. You usually kind of pull soil tests. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get a ballpark idea where what you want, need to put on. When I do the wheat in the fall of the year, I use a dry mix, of, and I put down 10 pounds of phosphate and 20 pounds of the mm -hmm. And then in the spring, we come back and put on uh, some nitrogen and sulfur usually, a herbicide. I'm sold on herbicides. Eliminate the weed pressure as many places as you can. Do you have different practices under your irrigated versus your dry land? Well, we're in a little different rotation out there. Used to be we did beans and wheat, and uh, our bean yields just really tailed off. So we put corn in the rotation out there, and that has seemed to help that. And I have raised irrigated millet just as a cheap fell crop and a water saver. Are you seeing similar benefits in, in the irrigated as well? Yeah, it has to because you're not disturbing that ground and drying it out mm -hmm. as bad. And then uh, you got a residue cover there to help hold it and, and keep the moisture there. So in, in a dry bean scenario, unless you're doing a direct harvest, you're disturbing the soil pretty good by the yeah, time you get them harvested. Yeah, there's some residue left, but it's, it's minimal. If you're behind corn, you still got some corn cobs and stuff laying out there from the year before, mm -hmm. so you got some of that on the surface yet. Is there any specific practices you're doing to try to deal with that increase in residue? In the strip till, what I'm usually doing there is I'm putting trash whippers down on the planter. Mm -hmm. Dry land, I don't have to rent them. You get that, that berm created with the strip till, and then you usually have quite a bit of straw, wheat straw in there, and you put those trash whippers out, it gives you a little cleaner base to plant into. Mm -hmm. By the time we get back into wheat, it's not an issue. The corn, we're usually chopping stalks in the spring, some form or another, so you get them broke down into chunks that are easy enough to handle. Mm -hmm. As you've looked at the no-till and the strip-till and some of the crop rotations and 
different things. Is there something you would do differently if you were to do that again? Like I say, it's, you just have to learn with your own conditions and go from there. We're so limited on what we can grow in this country. Mm -hmm. That's part of our issue. What kind of a learning curve was there? It sounds like you're always experimenting with it, so maybe the learning curve is continuing. Yeah, it's continuous, <laughs> I think. Um, in this country, usually what worked last year doesn't work this year, so you just know that you're going to have something that you're going to deal with that you probably didn't plan on. I think if a guy stays in the system and is diligent enough with it, you can, you can help your organic matter out quite a bit. So you kind of go into it with a plan, but you also try to be flexible to adjust to... You better plan on being flexible. <laughs> what kind of advice would you have for somebody that was interested in trying some no-till or, or maybe adding a strip-till practice into their production? If something doesn't work, uh, don't be afraid to change your practice. See if something else will work a little better. Don't give up if you have a wreck uh, and be prepared for some wrecks.